I, I am uh, receiving a number of emails on a subject that I introduced right here in one of these meetings. That was about a saint named Baba Fakir Chand. I studied in a college in Hosharpur. My father was teaching there. And Baba Fakir Chand lived there as our neighbor. And he was considered a perfect living master. And his discourses became so famous. And some critics have said he was the only true master in the whole history of masters. Because he said, I know nothing at all. He said, no master can know anything about anybody. He said, masters are totally ignorant. And he named everybody. Sorry, Jesus Christ, Buddha, Guru Nanak, my master, great master, and himself. And he made exception to his master, I think. But anyway, he said, masters do nothing. And what you are getting, you feel master doing? Not at all. It's your own mind doing it. Now, he has said this many times. I recently saw a YouTube uh, program of his in London, in which he's telling, he's sitting at home, somebody's home, and telling, look, I'm telling you again. This is all inside you. We know nothing. We just are pretending to know all that just to make you feel happy. There's a biography of that man. The title is The Unknowing Saint. So they all acknowledged his extraordinary teaching by which he says, Masters know nothing. Whatever you're getting is inside you. I attended one of his meetings where one of his disciples who had attained the same status like his master, whose name was Tarachan, Saint Tarachan. Saint Tarachan lived 300 miles away from where this Fakirchan stayed. At that particular festive occasion on which I heard that talk, Saint Tarachan had also come to attend that meeting. So Fakirchan was sitting on the stage, so he asked Tarachan to sit next to him. Both were acknowledged saints. And Fakir Chand started talking. And he gave his usual talk that we have to go within ourselves to find the truth, all truth lies inside, and so on, which was common stuff. And toward the end, he began to say, I know nothing. He said, Look at this one woman in Usharpur. She says that at night she was crying with pain. She was my disciple. I had taught her how to meditate. She was crying with pain. And I appeared. She says, Master appeared, Fakir Chand appeared in front of her and said, Why are you crying? She said, I have got this pain. No, oh, there is some black salt lying on top of your shelf. Take it with the water. You'll be all right. She took the black salt. Fakir Chand disappeared. Pain was gone. Early morning, she came running to Fakir Chand. Said, Thank you, thank you very much for saving my life last night. He said, What are you talking? I don't save anybody's lives. She said, but you came, you manifested yourself, I saw you, and you told me where the medicine is. He said, I was not there. By the way, let me clarify, I never go at night to any lady's bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> so, he, he is telling all the story in the discourse himself. He says, what people get the manifestation is their own mind. Their own mind has picked up, they themselves have picked up. And it is just a suggestion that they make and they get it. It helps them. But don't give the credit to the human being whom you call a master. Now, when he's finished speaking, he said, I am very happy. Saint Tarachan is also here, sitting next to me. I'll request him to say a few words. Then Saint Tarachan spoke. He said, don't believe this man. <laughs> Opening sentence. He said, if he knows nothing, I will never waste my time and money to travel 300 miles to come and put my head on his feet. Everything I've got is from this man. And then he explains what Tarach has explained many times, but he didn't explain that day. 
He said what he means is not being understood by people. What he means is in our essential truth, the ultimate truth, we are only one, not two. He is talking of that truth, that at that truth, what you think is Sarachan is also yourself, what you think is your master is also yourself. Therefore, he said that you get everything within your own self. He is talking from a different point of view. Don't miss this point. Now, when these people write these emails to me, they forget this part. They said, we are devastated by knowing that masters know nothing and they are only pretending to be masters. Do you also tell lies to us? He asked me direct question. I said, I tell the truth. I know nothing. <laughs> Very simple. <laughs> they forget who, who the question is being addressed. If question is being addressed to Ishwar Puri, he knows nothing. Believe me, it's not the body that knows. It's not even the mind that knows, it's beyond that. So when we say a master is telling us this, it's not the human body that we're talking of. That information is coming from somewhere else. And masters are also aware of it. So that is why Tara Chand has not been fully understood and I thought I'd explain it to you. What he exactly meant, what he meant was that the truth is actually inside you. Because when you realize the truth, you'll find the whole creation is being created from the point which is accessible right now inside you. It's amazing, amazing miracle that something that creates the entire universe which is so huge and other universes are even huger, that these huge universes are being created from a point which is accessible to a human being at a point within this physical body. It's not a small thing. It's a very big miracle. And they are referring to the ability to reach that point where no distinction will be left between you and me. There will be no you and me. And that's the point that he was making. That's the point from where we start. And that's our, that's our true home. Where we belong in spiritual form. Experiencing nothing but love, bliss, ultimate awareness, ultimate knowledge. All the time. And no time. Because there is no time. No time is all time. Now, this is a very interesting point about no time and all time. How can no time be all time? Do you know zero time and infinite time are the same? How can that be? This question, how can it be, is a mental question and there is no answer for the mind. Because mind does not function in concepts such as these. So, therefore, mind tries to understand and find a big contradiction. This is huge, infinite. This is nothing, small. But they don't understand this, that at a certain level, this becomes very simple to understand. When you find something that is happening now, we are not seeing it. You know what that is? We are all living in now. Nobody lives outside of it. When somebody told me there's a book that says live in the now, I was surprised. I wanted to know anybody in the world I'd like to meet who does not live in the now. It's impossible. There is no other time in which we live. The present is always now. And wherever we are living, it's in now. And now imagine the next step now has no time whatsoever. How can we be living in a point which is a time frame, past, present, future, we are living in that, as yet we are living at a point in past, present, future, which has no time at all. Not even a billionth part of a nanosecond. The moment we start saying anything, it's past. Before we said it was future. We are living in a timeless now, nobody experiences it. How come? Here, all of us are sitting here, all of us are living in zero time, and we are still not knowing it. What is stopping us? How can we be so ignorant that the very thing like existence, existing now, that we are living in a timeless now, we are experiencing it, we are experiencing nothing else except now. The rest is only added on to it. Past is being added on to it, future is being added on to it, seems to move. But now there is no time at all. Yet mind cannot understand it. 
If we try to understand with the mind, we, we get confused. We can't understand it. Because mind cannot understand anything that is not in time and space. It's a big limitation. Very big limitation of the mind. It can never understand anything that's not in time and space. And that is why now is out of time and space. And we're all living in it right here. Not in our true home. Not anywhere else. Right in the physical plane. And in the astral plane. And the dream state. In every state we are always living in the now. And none of us has recognized it. That we are living in zero time. How come we don't know it? I tell you how. We know it. Because we have given a new definition to now. The definition is present. We are living in the present. We are not living in the now. We should be living in the now, but we are living in the present. And what is present? Present is recent past. Few minutes ago, present. Now, I have just spoken to you. Now, is present. So we are including a little part of our past and calling it present and calling it now. Big mistake to call past as present and then to call it now. There is present, what we call present, is all past. What about future? Must be something, okay, we I recognize. There is no present, it's zero. Past is there. You are calling it now, let's call it recent past and past. Recent past, we call present and now. Delayed past, we don't know where the cutoff line is, but some cutoff line, and that is old past, recent past. At least future should be there. Not at all. What is creating a future for us? Imagine. Now, you have to contemplate on this one, even mentally. Contemplate. If we did not have things like hope, fear, anticipation. Supposing these three things are taken out of our dictionaries and out of our experiences, no future. Have you examined that? Hoping creates future, fearing creates future, <coughs> Anticipating creates future. Anticipating is neutral. Fearing is negative anticipation. Hope is positive anticipation. So only anticipation creates future. If we don't anticipate, there's no future. Is it true? And when I tell the psychologists to examine it, they're baffled by it. That we never thought like this. That there is really no future. We're making it up. And now the best thing comes to hope takes time, therefore it's the past. To fear takes time, it's the past. To anticipate takes time, it's the past. Future is past. Therefore, what we call past is past. What is called present is past. What we call future is also past. There is nothing happening here except past. And there is no way for any one of us to go into the past and live it. Then meditation, you might do it. Not here. In the physical plane, we never can live the past. What's gone, gone. Then how, do, how are we living? How we experience in this physical world, if everything is past, there's only one way to live in the past, recall it. That's memory. Memory means you can recall something and make it so real as if it is happening now, recent past. Memory can pull even the furthest points in past and bring them now. And when memory pulls and brings them here and becomes present for us, at that time, it's not present, it's memory bringing past and making it present for us. Now this looks like very weird new knowledge. It's not at all new knowledge. Any one of you wants to go and check out what I'm saying, just go two steps. Become unaware of this body by meditation, by drawing your attention to third eye center. Withdraw your attention within the third eye center in the inner body. So next step, you'll see the truth of what I'm saying, that nothing is being used to create destinies here except memory capsules. Memory capsules are being installed into consciousness and we are placed into this and this is just a replay of memory. Therefore, it's appropriate to say everything is predetermined. If it's already memory capsule, we are picked up and living, it's a predetermined destiny. It's a, it's a great... A great, con not only concept, you can have experience of what I am saying. Isn't that remarkable to understand how destinies are made, how life we are living, what we are calling the present, 
is not only but replay of something. But there can be no memory if nothing was ever happening. Where's the memory coming from? That's another big question. It is being created at a level at the mind. Universal mind, not this mind. Just like there is only one totality of consciousness, one soul, and all souls are the many in the soul. Similarly, there is one universal mind, and all minds participate in it, and we look like individual minds at this stage, and at the astral stage. So that is why, when we go to see the formation of those, that is taking place in an area where the origin of time starts. Now I must tell you the different experiences you can have in meditation. Here time flows in one direction. It doesn't flow two directions. It's always something in the future that we are thinking about. It comes to pass, becomes present and moves quickly into the past. One way direction. Time is flowing to the future which has bothered the scientists so much. For the last 30 years, they have been bothered with this concept. If space-time is one concept, is one thing, according to Einstein, that space-time is one thing, space ordinates, time additional ordinate of space-time. If that is so, how come we can move in space forward and backwards? Why can't we move forward and backward in time? If truly space-time is one unit and functions like that, Einsteinian concepts have been proven over, over, over and over again, more so with the recent neutrinos clash and creating uh, more gravitational waves and so on. Many of the things that he said have proven correct, including that time and space are joint. If that is so, why should there be a distinction that in space we can move both ways? in the physical experiences outside. In time, we cannot. One scientist has recently put up a new hypothesis. He has looked at the shape of the atoms. And atoms, like all particles, are spherical. Orbits are not spherical, but particles are spherical. He found some atoms which are not spherical, slightly pear-shaped. When he discovered even a few atoms that are pear-shaped, he thinks they are responsible for our not letting time be experienced as two way. And they, that pale shape of the atom is preventing us, made up of similar atoms, from seeing. A hypothesis that has been criticized by everybody else, but he says, I want to prove. Otherwise, you find a proof. You said that time and space are one concept, one thing. Then you prove why we can't move backwards and forwards in time. Now, here come these. Simple saints living in little mountains in the Himalayas saying we travel back and forth all the time. Time is as good as space. But you are mistaken if you can do it with the physical body thinking it is the only physical reality. But in reality you can move on time exactly like in space. But not here. You can do it at a causal plane. At a plane where the sensory systems are not tied down to you. Where the physical matter is not tied down to you. But you are still there with your thoughts, with your thinking capacity, with your life. You can travel to past and future and see they are all there at the same time. Now, surprisingly enough, this concept that past, present and future exist at the same time has been finally accepted by physics and astronomy, by observations. That one man's past can be another person's future at the same time. So the, the concept of time that is moving is gone. It's not moving, it's static. That we are moving on time, time is not moving through us. So once these, I can tell you, scientists will also break through into some of these things which we are talking are not accessible to mind today. Because they are trying to go beyond the mind too. They are going to go into intuitive thinking too. Scientists are going into that. So that is why what I am telling you something to examine. That how we are creating not only time, space, we are creating destinies. And people say, why is my destiny like that? Who made it? Why did God create such bad karma for me? Please tell me. I get 
question like this i said who made your destiny god must have made it as have you seen god have you questioned him no they how are you accusing somebody you haven't seen have no knowledge of there should be some basis for your argument that god put the karma hey, let me state it out the facts for you first you created your destiny nobody else but then they say that if i created destiny i should be able to change it now i am i'm sick with fever i have got high temperature i am crying and you are telling me i created my fever yes you did then why don't you tell me how to get out of it sorry you can't get out of it what kind of creator am i of my own destiny that i can't change my destiny when i don't like it oh you did not create it with the name you are giving to yourself is the name of your body body is not you that created the destiny at all what is inside the body your inside living imagination is not the creator of destiny at all your mind that is now thinking in physical terms or in astral terms did not create the destiny at all but your mind at the higher level created all the destiny for you it was you created it nobody else it's your karma you created it it's your life your destiny how can you blame somebody you don't even know this blame game to bring god in or bring some other power in you did it to yourself but that is not what the law of karma says here law of karma says that we create our reactions to actions in our what we do right now here and not that we do done something far away the law of karma says you do good things here you will get rewarded for it you do bad things here you will be punished for it it is something to deal with our actions here then how is how does it happen that now we are being told it was done by us somewhere else and somebody else which we have forgotten all together about and the ignorant how do you explain this discrepancy the big discrepancy discrepancy is arising out of the fact we think this body is the self that's the problem let's move one step away from this this body is not the self but the self that resides in the body simple change that the self was a director and creator of a lloyd drama got the script prepared personally or somehow got a nice script prepared and set up the characters and there were several characters in the drama that one has to come across and decided to watch the show set up the show on a stage and all the characters began to act looks like a show doesn't look real so the director and the author of the drama said let me go and see it closer when he came close let me get in so inside one of the characters and then see how it looks like and got inside one character and began to feel that the director and the author of the whole destiny was a character and the character now cries i want fever how do i solve it the actor did not create it that's part of the script the actor never wrote the script the author and the director who produced and wrote the script and acted out and and prepared a memory out of it of the whole a dvd prepared and placed it and played it they playing it within one actor it doesn't make you the creator of your universe then who is the creator inside us can we name him people who are doing deep meditation along with me i have done deep meditation and they go into the astral stage astral stage is very simple to achieve much easier than the causal or the higher stages astral stage can be achieved when you put so much of your attention in the center of your head and begin to imagine things that are happening there just imagination and you begin to imagine whole purpose being not to be aware of your body when you can be unaware of your body 
you automatically open up other awarenesses and even the awareness of the world disappears, it's connected with the body. When that happens, then you can feel you and the body were separate. Body was a cover on you. And the name you had given to yourself by which everybody called you was not your name. The name of your body given by some other actor you called your body's parents. Or somebody else in a part of the actor on the stage called a church or some other temple where you were, your body was given a name. All the time I was thinking that was my name and realization comes in. And what is my name then? If that is name of the body, what is my name? And this body, this was my name. But I can remember 300 years ago in my memory, it's a different body. And the name was different of the body. And then we go further down. Every lifetime I've had, the name was different. Sometimes even the gender was different. I couldn't imagine I'm a man now. I could be a woman one time. But I've seen myself in that body. I can remember it very clearly. Like I live life here, I can remember that part. All these, when they come up, you realize... You have no name at all. You are a nameless state because you don't need a name. You don't need a name. If you want to use a name, you can use any name you want. But it doesn't matter at all. What happens if you go to the next stage? There you find names were only introduced where characterization was needed where characters were needed and nowhere else. At the top, it's nameless. Some people say, Anami. Anami means no name. You cannot name yourself. Your true self cannot be named. Yet we answer to call them by your name. We are called by your name. Rigidly put attention. Yes. It's an act. It's a predetermined act being played out. Imagine how, what your attitude toward life would be if you had this experience of yourself going into that state and discovering the origin of your destinies. But then one question remains, a question put by the characters here. The character says, I don't know who you are talking to me, telling you are sitting inside me and making me up. All I know is I am so and so in this body. I am having the fever, you are having nothing, I don't know what you are having. And the answer is, who are you? Who is speaking? Who is speaking? Life is speaking, I am the life. When I am pulled out, you can't speak, you are dead. <laughs> they were, who is speaking? You are expressing something on your current state. Very good. You have fever, you don't want it. Very good. You are trapped. In physical world, very good. You don't like it, very good. If you don't, if you like it, you'll never get out. If you don't like it, you will get out. You are doing a great job, good for yourself, that you have high fever, you've got a lot of problems. The, the girl you loved has ditched you, the man was all disloyal to you, everything happened bad here. Very good. These are the things that will help you to go away from here. These are signs of being a seeker of something else. Well designed. So whole attitude changes. Imagine what simple meditation, discovering what else is inside you can do to your life right here. It changes you completely. Where does happiness come from? Happiness comes from enjoying a show. We go and see a movie and we pay. Sometimes ten dollars, seven dollars. I don't know where the ticket was. I don't go to movies too often. Reason being, I cry too much in the movies. I don't cry in real life, but I don't know what happens to me in the movies. I take them as more real than real life. But you pay to see murder being committed. You pay to see tragedies taking place, and you come out happy. Great movie. Very high review. What did you see? Great murder was done there. And the detectives found out. 
What are you enjoying? Oh, but it's just a movie. That's why you're enjoying. So it's just a movie. Imagine if while you're living in this physical world, you can find out what you thought was real was just a movie. What will be your attitude? You'll be enjoying the show. Now imagine this can be done right now. If you just sit inside, simple meditation, not high meditation, not deep meditation, simple meditation that you can assume, even you can use your mental thinking. I am wearing a body around me. I, mean, I am sitting behind the eyes watching what this character is doing, just that much. If you can do this, this life becomes a movie. And then you enjoy the show. And everything that is happening becomes something happening to something that is covering you and not happening to you. When the highest form of consciousness is attained, the whole purpose of creation is explained right there and there. No questions are left at all. Most questions, almost 99.99% questions are answered at the causal plane. And any 0.001% left over is answered when you go beyond the mind. No questions are left. Therefore, all answers to all your questions are inside. You can find all answers. No need to write to anybody. Certainly not to me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to cut down my email list. <laughs> the point is, let me explain a simple truth. Simple truth, you cannot ask a question if you don't have the answer already hidden in you. You cannot formulate a question. A for question cannot be formulated if you don't have the answer. The answer is prompting the question. Supposing you ask a question and I give an incorrect answer, you say, no, 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 that doesn't make sense. <laughs> how can you say it? If it's a genuine question, how can you say no to me? And if I give you the right answer, yes, that's I what I know. <laughs> you knew the answer before you asked the question. But the answer was hidden, not articulated, not spoken. All I did was to speak the answer which is hidden inside you. I didn't give anything new. If I gave something new, you rejected it. It's not the correct answer. So only that answer comes and appeals to you as correct, which is already there. And that is why it's the hidden answers. Hidden answers are like hidden knowledge. Our knowledge about ourselves is hidden from us. And that is why it looks like questions, looks like doubts, looks like fears. The mind actively pursues these hidden answers, but looks downwards for answers instead of upwards for answers. The answers are hidden there. And all answers can be found inside. But the mind is looking outside for answers. And that is why it re-establishes the outside reality, the only reality. Because that's where you have to look for answers. I must ask some wise man. And most wise men I have come across are very wise. They don't speak. You notice that very wise men hardly speak. Which also means I am not a wise man at all. I speak <laughs> too much. <laughs> there is a saying attributed to an Indian saint Bika, and in Indian language it says Bika baat agam ki kahen sunan mein nahi, jo jaane so kahe na, jo kahe so jaane nahi. It's translation. Oh Bika, the knowledge of the insight cannot be spoken. And one who speaks knows nothing, and one who knows never speaks. So that is why these wise men are very simple. Somebody sent me a cartoon the other day. There is a wise man sitting, and an intellectual disciple of his comes up. Master, do you have any words of advice? He says, how do we get happiness, Master? Tell me. He answers, don't argue with idiots. He said, Master, I don't agree with what you are saying. I agree with you. <laughs> so, <laughs> wisdom is expressed in many ways. <laughs> so that is why uh, meditation has peripheral benefits. These are the peripheral benefits I am mentioning. That 
your clarity of observe, observation improves considerably. It not only improves in the sense of you are having some inner experiences, that's a minor thing according to me, but the fact that you have a point of observation available to you even here in the physical world, it's a very big peripheral benefit. Your memory improves with meditation. Your ability to correlate that memory with current affairs improves. Your clarity of understanding what's going on improves. Your ability to deal with the idiots improves. <laughs> <laughs> Einstein said, there is one difference between stupidity and infinity or something, he says. Infinity has no end, stupidity has or something like that. I don't remember the full quote. <laughs> but it's about, he's, he's uh, talking about the prevalence of stupidity all over. Why does he call us stupid? Because what he saw, we can't see. That's simple. These wise men come and they can see something we can't see. So we think they are stupid. And they keep quiet. They don't say you are stupid. But they keep quiet. And that is why, in the matter of all questions and answers, best place to get the most accurate answers to your questions go inside. A man, I've told you the story before, but I can repeat it. A man came to Great Master. I was there. I was young, but I was sitting there next to him. Man <clears throat> brought his daughter and said, Master, my daughter is grown up and the family decided to marry her. She wants to go for education, higher education. What is the correct thing to do? Master said, what's the difference between boys and girls? If boys can go for higher education, so can daughters. Let her go to college. He said, thank you very much. The girl said, thank you, and they walked away. Within five minutes or ten minutes, another dad comes up with his daughter. Identical situation. He says, Master, my daughter has grown up and the family is deciding to marry her. She wants to go to higher education. What's the correct thing to do? He says, what are girls to do with education? They should run the home. No, no, marry her. Let her set up a family and so on. It's not job to go to higher education. In 10 minutes, he changed his answer. Which was the correct answer? Was the first answer correct? Was the second answer was correct? We heard this. Which answer is correct? Both were correct. He could see the circumstances of the two families which we could not see. Just because we can't see something, we are trying to judge the correctness of an answer. We are doing it all the time. We don't see the full facts even. We don't have the ability to see full facts. We are so enclosed with our body, with our senses, with our limited mind, that we only see in this limited way, have no knowledge of the total facts, we try to judge the answers given. That is why the answers can never be understood like this. Which one is correct, which one is wrong. One day a man comes to great master, master, how can I make progress? Work hard, meditate more. After a few years he comes and says, master, how can I make progress? Forget about meditation. Love and devotion is enough. Grace of the Master will take care of it. Which one was correct? Both were correct. At the two timings of the same person. So that is why it is our illogical mind that is trying to fix up some kind of a frame of answers of good and correct answers and bad answers or something. This is all relative. All relative. And we have no knowledge which one is correct. A man comes to great master, he says, Master, you told us not to drink alcohol. You told us be vegetarian, don't eat meat. You told us lead a good moral life and don't womanize and do things like that. Master, last night I did everything wrong. I was bad company. I drank alcohol. I womanized. I ate big meat there in that party. Please forgive me. Great master said, okay, forgive her, don't do it again. He said, thank you, thank you, ran very happy. And 
हेड मास्टर ओन सेक्रेटरी रा सिटिंग अराउंड हिम सरप्राइज एट द डिसीजन ये हेड मास्टर गिव सेड मास्टर ही डिसोबेड यू दिस मैन डजंट फॉलो योर इंस्ट्रक्शंस एंड ही जस्ट कम्स एंड सेज फॉरगिव मी एंड यू फॉरगिव हिम हेड मास्टर सेड लुक he came with his mind punishing him while he was coming to me his mind was punishing him and i was seeing him should i punish him or i forgive him then the one uh, old secretary sitting next to him said but master supposing he does this all over again and does again come to you will you again forgive him and master smiled said i think i'll again forgive him master we come third time like that will you still forgive him I think I will still forgive him, Master. When will you punish him? He said, "Leave me on the side of forgivers and not punishers." Every man is carrying a punisher in his head, his own mind. That negative mind, guilt, is punishing people like nobody's business. Don't let, let me be added to that category called guilt and mind punishing people. Let me forgive. one of the qualities you will always find in a perfect living master always a forgiver always no exception always loving you no exception always a conditional love no exception is something of a different experience to be with such a person i'm telling you by own experience i'm telling you so un- almost surreal experience in this physical world when you meet all the other people is totally different everybody has expectation from you everybody is getting disappointed if you don't meet their expectations and anger comes up anger and lustful feelings anger feelings possessive feeling greed is so strong in us and look at the masters none of that how is that possible how can a human being live like that when we are all facing all these things how can a human being live just amongst us like ourselves and be free of these things it looks like a miracle just to be with that man and that is why it's a remarkable experience and where how do you get it same answer i gave in the morning see inside he will come into your life by coincidence these are great coincidences and coincidences look like accidents they are not coincidences are designed for a purpose when the destiny is designed coincidences are also designed and they are designed to occur to let you know when you are a seeker by getting you disgusted with life to let you know when you are ready when you feel nothing can be found here going to find the truth and destiny that you are a seeker and seeking the ultimate truth by coincidence a perfect living master appears it does not mean that while you are seeking the truth nobody appears lots of masters can be found by you not a peer you can find them you can research there is one wonderful place nowadays called google <laughs> everything can be found including masters you can find them at google <laughs> so you can find the master those masters come at that stage of your seeking when you are seeking something less than the ultimate as you begin to say seek more than what you are getting the other masters appear finally when you are seeking the ultimate a perfect living master appears in your life so this is a natural and what happens coincidences when a person meditates the number of coincidences increases i hear it from everybody that when we meditate we find more coincidences taking place in our life now is it that they begin to notice more coincidences or really more coincidences are happening it doesn't matter which way because they are designed to be noticed when you are ready for them they are meant for that it doesn't matter when you notice or not when you notice that is the time they are meant for that coincidence and so that is why when these coincidences happen you move forward and this all beautifully arranged imagine if you see the whole show what it look like not only the show of this creation show of the entire creation at every level and imagine that is possible when you are ready for that when you seeking for that and a perfect living master not a master a perfect living master living or is a human being living like us not an imagination of our mind a past master 
can never appear in the form he appeared when he was alive. It will always appear as your own mental imaginary image. Don't forget that part. A master living far away whom you have never seen is your imagination. But a master whose hand you can touch, a master who is alive like ourselves, who is equal to us, like becomes like ourselves, comes like ourselves, is the one, if he carries that awareness of the totality, is a true master, perfectly master. Perfect because all perfection is above the mind. All imperfection is below the mind. That is why we call him a perfect living master. And he has certain quali qualifications. One, he is simply ordinary person. If he is not ordinary, extraordinary, he is somebody extraordinary with high destiny. But not a perfect living master. If he says, I am a master, he is not a perfect living master at all. He has not even overcome his ego still which is one of the five vices, you know. The ego is the last to go. He hasn't gone through that stage yet. Therefore, perfect living masters have never claimed that they are masters. And the third, love is unconditional. Somebody asked me, he said, I have two masters. I am confused. Which one to follow? I said, no, it's not a confusion. Whoever pulls you, which is love. Follow him. I thought I gave a very wise answer. He wrote, wrote to me, both pull me equally. <laughs> I said, you are the luckiest man on earth. Here people don't get love from one person, you're getting from two. <laughs> Follow anyone. <laughs> so it is a, these three coincidences happen automatically. I am so happy to share these experiences with you. Because I was initiated, accepted by this man whose photo you see behind. Perfect living master, Azul Maharaj Baba Sahan Singh. I call him perfect living master because whatever he promised, he delivered. I will know the definition for it now. Whatever he promised, he delivered. Somebody comes to me and says, I'll show you higher master. Somebody says, he was not a master. People have come to me. Simply because in India, I was on a reasonably important job. The civil service jobs are there. And when you become chief secretary of a state government, it's considered a very high job. Fortunately, I was sitting on that job. And people came from the place where the master lived, who was the master of my master's master. My master's name was Baba Saul Singh and his master's name was Baba Jamal Singh. And Baba Jamal Singh followed a Swamiji from Agra. Agra is another city, another state. And people who were still running that institution there, they came to me and met me to got an interview with me. A busy man for interview, group of them came and said, we have come to give you some good advice. I said, certainly, tell me. We come to tell you that you are following a fake master. I said, I follow Baba Saul saying it's fake. I said, any proof of that what you are saying? Yes, we have proof. That's what we come to tell you. The proof is, he claims he was initiated by Baba Jamal Singh. Baba Jamal Singh claims he was initiated by Swamiji of Agra, Sayyid Sivdiyal Singh. Now, Sayyid Shiv Dhyal Singh, when he passed away, he declared who will carry on his work. In a certain words recorded, which are called Akhari Bachat, last words. And there is exact, exact recording at the time when he spoke. On the Akhari Bachat, he names four persons that they are going to be carrying on his work. And Jamal Singh's name is nowhere there. He was never appointed by said Shivdhyal Singh. Moreover, there is no evidence by way of a will or a document to show that he was ever initiated by Swamiji. He was being named to be my master. And you are following the teachings of his disciple? And you think he is a master? They try to bring all this evidence. We have got books to show you all this. We have got tables to show you all this. I said, 
Let me tell you something. I didn't know Baba Jamal Singh. I have no idea who he was. I have no idea about Swamiji. He died 100 years ago. No idea at all. But I met one man named Baba Saul Singh. He said, if you do this, you get this. If you follow this, you do this. Whatever he said, I followed. It worked. What he promised, he delivered. For me, that's enough. So that is why I am accepting him because whatever definition I read of a perfect living master in the writings of Swamiji and writings of Jamal Singh and writings of several other masters, what the definition of a perfect living master was, I saw in that man, that man. And what he said, he delivered. For me, that's more than enough. I'm sorry to send you back disappointed, but I'm very happy where I am. Are you people happy? They turned their faces and walked away. <laughs> Why were they unhappy? They were unhappy, they could not persuade me. Not because of what they got or not got, I don't know anything about it. But I saw their unhappy faces because they thought they'll be easily able to persuade me with the facts they brought. Never forget your relationship is the master who initiates you, accepts you, and delivers what he says. And it's your own love and devotion that grows automatically when you are in contact with such a person. As I said, the mind creates doubts. The, mind, the doubts create fear. It's a natural thing. The mind has been trained to do that. Mind has been programmed to do that. It's a very good programming for the mind to create doubt. If there was no doubt, we could be so gullible anybody tells us something, we'll believe it. It's a good screening process. Doubts are very good as a screening process. You should screen everything through doubt and skepticism. But do not keep on doubting all your life. Don't say your whole life is to doubt and to, to clear your doubts. At some point, when doubts get cleared, and that's the point when the love, the pull of love you're experiencing overrides the pull of the doubt. It happens in every person's case who is with a perfect living master. That the pull of love of the master overcomes the obstruction caused by the doubt. And that's what happens. But doubts can be such that lead to questions. Doubt always lead to questions. How can I be sure? What's the proof? That reminds me of the story once again of the man in an Indian village. He was a professor, intellectual professor. He just happened to go to a village and village wells did not have any parapet walls around them and there was a level ground and walking in absent-mindedly thinking of something, he fell into the well. Fortunately, the water was not high, but he moaned and groaned, how did I fall into the well? I'm in wet water, but I'm not drowning. How will I get out of the well? Some passerby heard his moaning and groaning and came to help him. He came, I'm sorry you fell. I'll go and bring a rope and I'll try to pull you out with the rope. He said, wait, before you go, tell me why did I fall into the well? And furthermore, tell me how can I be sure you will bring a rope? And thirdly, also explain to me, if you bring a rope, how can I be sure that halfway when I'm climbing up with you, you again not drop me. Answer my question before you go to get your rope. He said, don't you think it will be a good idea to get out of the well and then discuss what happened? <laughs> no, I'm not going to get touch the rope and let you go. First answer my questions. And then you stay in the well. <laughs> this is what happens to us intellectuals. We spend our life questioning, 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 then we die. Never get an opportunity to take advantage of a human life given to us, a human life in which alone we have a strange experience of free will, an experience of decision making, an experience which may be totally illusionary, but the experience gets, makes us a seeker. You can't be a seeker if you have no free will, and free will exists only in one species out of so-called 8.4 million forms of life where we can seek, and that's human life. We waste our human life the whole life in questioning because of the mind. Are we slaves of the mind? Can't we see what the mind is doing? Can't we see the delays causing in our own journey? So that is why 
a good thing to screen, good things to examine, good thing to be sure. But when you feel there is something extraordinary happening, coincidences are happening, let's take one step and see. If it doesn't work, pull back. If somebody says there's something lying inside, go and check out. Okay, I'll go check out. If it's not there, I'll come back. I'm not losing anything. That should be the attitude. And not that we should be questioning all our life and getting nothing out of it. Thank you very much for again attending to my long conversation with you. One way conversation. <laughs> but we'll have two way conversation with a few people today. I believe there are some people who come for the first time to this meeting. And I'd like to spend a few minutes in a bipartisan two way conversation with them. So I'll have that for about an hour. And then we'll finish. You are all welcome to go back home. And next month we'll meet again. Thank you.